This week on CrossFeed. In God we trust for security. Marketing. The church versus Starbucks. Investigate the Mormons. Online prayer support. And Malaysia does not like Michael W. Smith, Amy Grant, or anybody else. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Hey, Pastor Jim Butler of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts. Welcome, everybody. So we're uh, we're running a little bit late uh, this week, but, um, you know, it's it's busy time for us. It's Advent, uh, and, uh, well, sorry about that, but... Hey, folks, he's being nice. It's my fault. I got stuck in a meeting that didn't end until 10 o'clock on Thursday night. So that's that's why uh, we're doing this late. And uh, actually, I need to say that because I had mentioned to my son uh, that he would be expecting a, a new one up by Friday. So he um, didn't get that. So uh, he and he does download it over, listen to it over there in uh, um, Iraq. So uh it's one of the things he really looks forward to. So I, I feel bad that I, I didn't have it up there for him. Man, what priorities, huh? Jeez, yeah, he know. puts stuff at church ahead of podcasting. Sheesh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'll tell you. So. Trying to do my job. I, You know, mistake I'm doing there. Shouldn't, shouldn't, should try and do my work, I guess. Yeah, what's more important? <laughs> well, where do you want to start tonight? Um, well, let's, let's start with the one that may get us cut off and on and stuff. And, uh, the guy dealing with, uh, the more, uh, um, Starbucks, uh, okay. and his, his church advertising. I, I thought this was a pretty creative little, um, commercial. I yeah, this is good. Gotta get out of this. this is from a, um, a blog, uh, and, uh, oh, I forgot the name of it. Um, it's the Dallas Morning News, uh, uh, That's a yeah, but it's it's from a blog. church it's religion. A uh, church marketing blog. Church marketing blog is um, beyond relevant. There you go. It had relevant in the title, so uh, it's a good. Um, I'll I'll recommend this as a you know sort of pick and choose from it. Uh, some stuff you might agree with, some stuff you might not. Um, but uh, he actually, um, we'll let you watch the video. They actually have been. I've been. I started to follow it. It was kind of interesting, uh, some interesting insights, that they are actually doing kind of a series of blog posts based on this video. And so um, so I'll bring up the video here. been to a coffee shop since I was a little girl. Yes, you've been to a coffee shop. I've never been to one. Did you see their bumper stickers? Check them out. Yeah. Oh yeah, here we go. Park so far away. Okay. Greeter name tags. I've always been against those. I've always liked all the posts. I tell them, take it yourself, you know, going after the people you don't know. You know, you want to make people our, our guests, not just our guests. There you go. The old church growth thing, by the way. Now, people, people, don't just drink your coffee today. Let it fill you. Let it inspire you. Try an Americana, 
a mocha latte, the, and a cappuccino with the great '70s uh, fonts and stuff now, like I that. I want to remind everyone: don't forget our goal of converting 500 people to coffee. Remember, bring your non-coffee drinking friends with you. Drag them here if you have to. Buy them a scone, even. Just get them here. Because remember, coffee is good all the time. All the time. We feel we're the best kept secret in coffee shops. Last year alone, we had 75 new coffee drinkers, 75 new customers. We're not like those guys down the street that water their product down. We serve nothing but 100% pure coffee. Coffee is so important in everyday life, it's more important than air. Hey, how are you doing? What's looking for you today? The abbreviation on his uh, outfit. I've never been here before. His apron. No. Um, excuse me. If this is your first time visiting with us, would you go ahead and raise your hands? We would love to welcome you. <laughs> raise your hands now. <laughs> Javaluja. <laughs> we would love to get some information about you so we can follow up with you. If you could go ahead and fill those out, we'll be able to get things started. Oh, and when you bring those back to us, we'll have a special gift just for you. We just want some coffee. Uh, you can just go ahead and sit right over there to fill those out. That'd be great. Thank you. What could they possibly want all this information? You know, some people go skydiving. Yeah, I serve people coffee. It's a rush. I love it. I put my heart and soul oh, into that coffee. Wow. And there's nothing like seeing somebody take a sip of coffee for the first time in their life. We get a lot of visitors coming through. Not always do they come back, but deep down inside, I know a bean's been planted. Some people just can't take the real stuff. Thank you, Barista Mark. It's so good to see everyone at the International Anointed First Starbucks of the Northern Valley. And I want to draw our attention to the tip jar. This is real important. I want to share with you something that happened to me when I was just a new coffee drinker right out of college. I learned that I could combine giving to my barista with my coffee, and this is the result. I found out that when I gave, my coffee came back to me, pressed down, shaken together, and running out all over. And I was a changed man. It's because the word joy, J-O-Y, means Java others and you and when you include the you know, I've been thinking about National Coffee Day National Coffee Day is coming up you know and it's always a big day for us but this is what I'm going to do I'm going to send out a direct mailer and I'm sure our attendance is going to more than double and it's going to change everything and then in two weeks we're going to be serving coffee great. to the homeless you. and you're not going to want to miss that care. what can I get you today I think I just want some coffee okay that'll be 398 Oh, hey, what did you want to drink? Nothing. Um, I couldn't find the restroom anywhere. Let's, let's just get out of here. And there you are, sir. Thank you. Oh, I almost forgot. A special gift for being a first-time visitor. Thank you. May your day be filled with coffee. So, so we'll see you next week, right? Yeah. All right. I think my favorite part was the uh, the fonts on the bulletin board. This uh, like 1970s and the flowers and sunshine and or 60s even. <laughs> See, right. that didn't even I didn't even notice the fonts. It just it you know it's that sort of like okay, um, you know we're using just decor that's that's you know 30 40 years old. And stuff that particular styles that speak, you know, there are certain styles that are timeless. There are other styles that are very grounded in the decade that they were done. And I just, I've been in so many churches that are just, you walk in and you go, okay, yeah, it's been a while since they remodeled in here. My first church had orange shag carpeting. <laughs> this thing screamed 75. <laughs> and um, he said there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, building a couple gallons of gasoline in a match wouldn't fix. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, the 
it was. Um, I mean, I liked a lot of the things, um, you know, the, the doors that were locked. Uh, and I've seen that happen in, in, in you know, churches. And, uh, uh, like I said, the greeter there, and they just walk, just looks at the guy and just, you know, ignores him. And, you know, we, we stay away from that term. And I try to tell them, you know, your hosts. And these, these are not visitors, they're guests. So think of when you invite someone to come into your home, how do you want the person to feel? Mm-hmm. How do you want to treat the person? Um, and, uh, you know, that, and like I said, and I don't know how my audio came out. I actually was in a church one time where they made my wife and I stand up and introduce ourselves. <laughs> and nobody, nobody in the church said anything to us afterwards. <laughs> it's like church. a scarlet letter. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was, um, it was, the church was only two blocks away from our apartment, our fourth year in seminary. And, uh, I think the building inhibited them. They had this, you know, I think the sanctuary inhibited them because interestingly enough, we went back there for New Year's, uh, they did, uh, around New Year's Eve. Uh, we had, we'd been attending another church that was about five miles away, but we, we went back to that church for some reason. And because, like, yeah, it was just two blocks away, so we could walk there. And their heater broke down, and so they had they were holding worship in their gymnasium. And the whole atmosphere was much open, more open, warm, inviting. Hmm. Uh, people talked to us, but and and we weren't the only. We, there's two other seminary couples uh, there in the apartment building. All of us had the exact same experience when we had gone there in their in their sanctuary, and when we, we had. And we all happened to go there the night of this, uh, when, the, when their heat broke down. And they were all like, man, the, the whole place was different. Hmm. But I really think their building inhibited them. Now, I have to share the best experience I've ever had as a visitor in a church. Um, it was when we went uh, to Kansas City uh, for... My hometown. Yeah. I don't know if it was your home church, though. It was. Uh, we were staying at uh, Motel 6. Uh, we just went there for a weekend. Uh, while I was down at seminary and, um, and we just thought, well, you know, when are we going to get another chance to go to Kansas city? And so we just thought we'd do it just to do it. And, um, so we went to this church. I don't remember the name of it. It was just the closest one to the motel six that we were staying at. And, um, nice service, you know, nothing, uh, particularly out of the ordinary in that. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't really remember any details about it. What I do remember is when we came out afterward, people just can't, started coming up to us and, and, um, introducing themselves to us and saying hi to us and just making us feel really welcome. One couple invited us over to their house for lunch afterward. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, wow. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we're like, man, if, if we were actually looking for a church, that's where we would have gone. You know, I mean, just because they made us feel welcome. They were, you know, they were, this was a church where you went there and the message we got was, we are really happy that you're here. Whether, and, and even, you know, and they found out that I was a, a seminarian through conversation. And so they knew that we weren't going to be joining the church, you know, or anything like that. But they were still just, you know, thrilled to have us there. And, and it was just like, just, you know, kind of felt like the guest of honor without being, um, you know, without this sort of raise your hand if you're a visitor or something like that, you know, um, you know, there was none of that. And, and, oh man, (laughs) I would hate a church where I had to stand up and, yep, I'm a visitor right here, you know, cause you know what, unless it's a really huge church, Everybody knows you're a visitor anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, and that's a problem. You get the, although, just, just two thoughts. Number one, a, a friend of mine was visiting a church in Michigan, and he said the only person who greeted him after service was another visitor. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really sad. Um, but the uh, – and, and some of those churches, large churches, people are, are kind of inhibited sometimes because they're, they're afraid uh, – if I ask the guy if he's a visitor – um, he, he, you know, he, uh, might go to the other service or something, you know, mm-hmm. and I've always told my people, you know, you don't have to ask them if you're a visitor, just say, I don't think I've met you, mm-hmm. you know, um, and they'll tell you, oh, I'm, I'm visiting today or, um, you know, whatever they, you know, they'll tell you 
any kind of information. All you have to say is, I don't know you. You know, oh, well, I, I usually go to the other service. Oh, okay. Well, now I know. Um, you, you are a member here. Um, cause I knew when my, my, again, my first church, we had two services and people could go to the other service and not know a soul there. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. So, no, th- that was good. Um, oh, the, the apron. They had this like string of, of letters. It was obviously some kind of abbreviation, like a WWJD kind of thing. Mm. But like there was no, it was, it, it was, I, I don't even remember what it was. And I, I sat there trying to figure out what it was supposed to stand for. And I think it was deliberately just a string of random letters. Hmm. Because no matter how much you think about it, it didn't even have, I don't think it even had like a C or, or anything like for coffee or anything like that. And I'm just going, hmm. What would that be? But, you know... Well, it, and we do in church should use our own lingo sometimes. Oh, yeah. We need to guide people through it. And hey, and the other th- Lutherans are horrible with that, you know? Oh, gosh. I mean, everything starts with an L. <laughs> you got your LLL and your LWML and your <laughs> LWR and... and <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, man. So The one part I'm going to disagree with them on... It almost sounds as if it's wrong to talk about um, offering or wrong to talk about stewardship in the church, you know, because that would be offensive to visitors. And <clears throat> reality is, you know, that's part of our our our, our life with God, mm-hmm. you know. And I don't think there's anything wrong with encouraging people to think about, um, you know, to, to, to preach and deal with those, those types of topics. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, there's. I mean, there's some churches, you know, that want to be so person sensitive that they they don't want to talk about sin or they don't want to do other things. Um, and that's the other part. I mean, almost. I don't know if he was trying to be snarky with the guy saying, "We think we've got the pure coffee here." Like, um, yeah. You know, who, you know, yeah. Not I mean, watered down like those other guys. Because I think we are right. Yeah. Yeah, and I would hope that regardless what uh, denomination a person's a part of, that you're a part of that because you think it's right. I mean, sadly, the reality is that, you know, okay, if I'm going to go to a coffee shop, and I'm not a coffee drinker, but I get some, like, a chai latte or something, but um, if I were going to go there, I might go there because my friends go there, okay? Church, unfortunately, a lot of people go because their friends go there. But, I mean, really, if you're going to go to a church, go there because you agree with its teachings. Although the reality is, if you're unchurched, if you're not going anywhere... You're not going to know the difference. True. You're really not. And, you know, uh, you know, and, uh, so if you, if you, I mean, you know, like I said at the beginning, you know, I, I've never been in a coffee shop. I haven't been in one since I was a kid. Okay. Mm-hmm. If, you, if this is where you are and you're just kind of, you're going to find whatever church, you know, kind of is where you are and meets your needs and things like that. But you're really not going to know what's different between a Lutheran and an Episcopalian. And a um, Baptist, and you know, you're not gonna worry much about it. What you're gonna be most concerned about is, you know, really, what's what's being said? Is this message relevant to my life? Mm-hmm. Um, is this a place where I feel comfortable and welcomed? I mean, those really are the things that you're gonna look for. Because um, there's a there's a book I don't know if you still had to read when, I, when you're in seminary that we had to read. It's called Why People Join the Church. Nope. And it was interestingly enough, it was a it was a research that was done by the Lutheran Church in the United Lutheran Council in the United States of America, a uh, group that used to exist. Um, it was an inter intercooperative Lutheran group, and went out of formation with the uh, with the formation of the ELCA. Anyway, this guy went to these unchurched counties and um, talked to people who have recently joined churches, and you know why? What brought you here? And it wouldn't surprise you. Most well, number one reason was a friend. Mm-hmm. Went there. Um, and other people, you know, it's kind of the end of a journey. It was this, that, the other thing. One person in the entire book said she joined a church because it was because of the doctrine. And she was Lutheran. Yeah. She had uh, read the Bible, came to believe in the Bible that Jesus was the Son of God, said, the next thing she said was, I should be baptized. You know, that's what I understand from this, that I need to be baptized. So, she started going to churches, and she said the church that, you know, with her her mind agreed with what the Bible said was Lutheran. So she became a member of a Lutheran congregation. <laughs> so, uh, but I had a member of my last church. 
um, and her husband in the military. And basically, it was whatever church was most convenient, where, where she had attended for years. Yeah. Um, I came, mean, came to Trinity and found, said, wow, this place, this is really great. This is kind of the best of everything I've ever been in. Hmm. So uh, I wound up becoming Lutheran, but um, for years, didn't really worry about it. I know that there are lots of different reasons. I mean, I, okay, I've got a friend who was at seminary. He ended up um, not staying there, ended up going back. He was a second career guy, went back to his first career, decided that seminary just wasn't for him. And um, and I know that he went to, when he when he went back, he didn't move back to, the, to where he had been, but it was in the same general area. And he um, he went to the closest Missouri Synod congregation and uh, went and talked to the pastor said uh you know i've i've got a year of seminary down so I've, you know i i'd be happy to um I, I you know i know i'm not a pastor or anything but i'd be happy to help out if you need somebody to teach bible classes or whatever you know i'd i'd love to get involved and he just they just kind of blew him off uh nobody talked to him or anything and <laughs> he tried it a couple times and just said this is ridiculous. I, I feel like an outcast, you know? And um and so he's like, the next closest Missouri Synod church is an hour away. And, you know, there's a bunch of other churches, but I want to take my family to a church that I agree with the teachings. And, I, you know, I, I don't even know. I, I kind of moved or something. We lost touch with him, and um, I haven't been able to track him down since. But So I never found out what happened after that. But um, if your friend has moved to the Boston area, he's welcome to join St. Luke's. I'll put him to work. No problem. <laughs> I've got work for him to do. So, hey, but you know what? You can join any church you want, but you better not join the Mormons because you might wind up being investigated right now. <laughs> All right. So this Proposition A thing won't die. Um, and... Uh, uh, Proposition 8, uh, which was, it didn't amend the Constitution. It, there was a different word. You're fooling yourself. We're living in a dictatorship. I can't remember what it was now. It's usually, they say it was an amendment, but I, I, it wasn't technically an amendment. But anyway, it defined marriage exclusively as a union between a man and a woman. And right. the Mormons were, we, we talked about it. What was it? A show or two ago that we talked about the um, the that commercial that was done by the the No on Eight uh, people that specifically targeted the Mormons, and so now they're being investigated by the California Fair Political Practices Commission um, to find out if they overstepped their boundaries in their uh, donations and support for this campaign. It jeopardizes my ability to effectively govern this student body. All right. Um, and it's interesting is they failed to report the value of work. Now, I'm not sure what, um, you know, how you can how you can do this. Um, now, this guy, this other article that we linked to is was a, an opinion editor, and the guy said, you know, how much money do they give? $2,864.21. I did not know that. Yeah. And it was an in-kind donation to pay for plane fare for some of its members. Right. Um, yeah, they, they, there's, there's a huge amount of... Um, yeah, so he, he argued basically what we have argued. You know, uh, the Catholic Church gave a lot more. Knights of Columbus gave a lot more. Uh, the... Um, um, uh, the, the, the black churches, you know, the black population, you know, was, was, you know, 70% in favor of it. But they don't go after any of them. They go after the Mormons because it's easier to go after the Mormons. Yep, they're an easy target. And, um, now interestingly enough, um, yesterday, uh, there were, there is a, um, I got a, a thing from National Review. Uh, the Beckett Fund has paid for an ad called No Mob Veto. It was in New York Times yesterday. And it's interesting that um, it is a, uh, many religious leaders. Um, and it says, uh, we're a disagreeable lot. We, we differ about many things. Uh, most, but not all of us, are religious believers. We disagree on moral and legal questions, including the wisdom and justice of California's Proposition 8. 
nevertheless were united in this, the violence, intimidation being directed against the LDS or Mormon Church and other religious organizations, and even against religious believers, simply because they supported Proposition 8, is an outrage that must stop. Let's be clear, even the crudest anti-religious propaganda isn't illegal and may not constitutionally be outlawed, but it is nevertheless wrong. It has no place in civilized society. Well, you know, that's the big irony here. I mean, Mormon Church is being vandalized. People are being threatened. It's all kinds of stuff. Why? Because they're hateful. You know, this is just like that YouTube comment that we got saying that we're hateful, you know, because of we take a, a particular position on a particular issue. Right. Even though we, uh, you know, are constantly emphasizing how much that even if you disagree or, you know, or whatever, that we still need to treat people with respect. Right. I mean, it's interesting some of the names on here, uh, you know, Dr. Alveda C. King, one of the uh, descendants of Martin Luther King, civil rights activist, Armando Valadares, uh, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Uh, Human Rights Commission. I mean, and uh, Ron Sider, Evangelicals for Social Action, uh, and some other evangelicals and Catholics and things like that. Yeah, it, it, you know, I have no problem with, you know, um, a hard-fought political campaign. And I understand that those people who are against us see this as a matter of human rights. I, I, I get where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. Um the fact of the matter is, though, unlike um, – because a lot of people want to compare it to uh, the days when uh, you know biracial marriages, black and white, were considered wrong. The um, reality is, is while that was uh, uh, illegal in some areas, it was still between a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, you know, not between, um, uh, uh, two men or two women. By, but, you know, this is, this is, you know, when we use the word marriage to define this relationship, we are changing the definition of marriage that had, and a definition that, that, that human history has never seen before. Yeah. There, I mean, there have been different societies that have been sort of pro gay societies. Um, Usually they got that way very shortly before they fell, interestingly enough, uh, if you look at their histories. Um, but, yeah, this is just, you know, marriage has a, a certain definition. And you know, it's, it's sort of like uh, how the abortion lobbies redefined conception. You know, people have always understood conception, and, you know, this is a relatively recent term, I suppose. Well, I guess not really. It's in the Bible. Um in the Old Testament, in fact. Um, but, you know, conception has always been understood as fertilization. But it's recent, within the past 30 years, has been redefined as uh, implantation. Um, and it's purely for political expediency. And for no other reason. No, there's no scientific basis to the change or anything like that. So the same thing here. It's wanting to redefine marriage to mean something that it's not. So, um, but and, even if you disagree with that, with that, to 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 be disrespectful, to uh, to try to intimidate, to vandalize, uh, that is always always wrong. There's just no way around it. Right. Yeah, yeah. If you're if you got a good point to make then make your point in a way that, you know, th this is just like when the, um, when it, during the elections, this happens every, every four years or even every two years, um, that you have the, uh, uh, political, the, the campaign signs in people's yards that get vandalized or torn up or whatever. And, you know, I always say that, boy, you know, so who vandalized it? With the people in favor of them or the people against them, because it ends up making the, you know, if, like in this past election, if you ruined a McCain sign, it makes Obama look bad, you know. Oh, oh, the Obama supporters are all vandals and stuff like that. So, 
you know, that's, that's always my perception when I saw those kind of things happen. So that's why I was kind of wondering, is there a, you know, who really did it? <laughs> is there somebody really thinking about this or, but, um, you know, and it happened to, you know, both parties, but, uh, you know, you look at this and you go, are you really even helping your cause by responding with violence? You know, then the, all that's going to do is it's going to cause groups like, you know, I, and I don't read their newsletter, but I can just imagine how the, a group like the American Family Association would respond to, to this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, see, look what those homosexuals and pro-homosexual groups are like. You know, they're just, they're all violent and, you know, and, and I'm not saying that that's right either to make those broad generalizations, but you don't have to help that stuff along. You know, you don't have to encourage people to make those generalizations. You're a representative when you act on behalf of, uh, whether it be a particular organization or whether you act on behalf of, of, um, a belief. Uh, you know, do it in a way that's going to support, you know, generate support for, um, for whatever it is that you're trying to stand up for, uh, not in a way that's going to really turn people off and say, man, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Absolutely. But maybe you disagree. You know, if maybe maybe you think, well, obviously some people watching this on YouTube do think it's okay to be rude and nasty. Uh, but, uh, you know, most of us don't. Um, but, uh, you know, do you have an opinion? How do you think we should? How, what would be the right way for us to, for Christians to get involved in things? Um, and particularly in um, political uh, uh Circumstances and religious organization be involved in political issues. And by the way, please, please understand there's a difference in both in state and federal laws between issues and political campaigns of people. Mm -hmm. That Proposition 8 was an issue and it's perfectly legitimate for churches to be involved, um, and perfectly legal. If it was a person, say a presidential race, that's different, that's considered to be different. Right, absolutely. Uh, but, uh, anyhow, contact us. Podcast at crossfeednews.com. Always interested in your comments, your thoughts, and everything else. Um, let's let's head over to the state, great state of Kentucky. Yep. And speaking of uh, there. church and politics. Yeah, speaking of church and politics. Um, the uh, American Atheists uh, Incorporated is suing the uh, state of Kentucky because... Uh, Kentucky's Office of Homeland Security says you can't keep the state safe without God's help. Now, safety and security of the state cannot be achieved apart from reliance upon Almighty God, and they are to stress that fact through training and educational materials. And it also includes the Bible verse, Unless the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. Uh, and the guy says this is one of the most eg eg egressly can't say that word. And egregious. Yeah, egregious. Egregiously, thank you. Egregiously. <laughs> and breathtakingly unconstitutional actions by a state legislature that I've ever seen. It says that it violates both the state and U.S. constitutions. Um, and um, I think he's right. Well, the other side says no government by itself can guarantee perfect security. There will always be this opposition to the acknowledgement of divine providence, but it's a foundational understanding of what America is. All right. Uh, I'm not sure that I like the idea of, of including this stuff in their documentation and in their training and stuff. At the same time, is it unconstitutional? I mean, based on what the Establishment Clause actually says, I mean, because they just say Almighty God, which narrows it down a little bit, because, like, that would leave out pagans and Wiccans and, well, that's your pagan, but, um, you know, it, it, it would at least narrow it down, um, to, to only supporting, uh, maybe a handful of, of monotheistic religions. No, I just think it's, it's, it, it's the type of thing I can see a, a politician saying it in a speech. Mm -hmm. You know, but to say, but to put this into legislation, saying, you know, this must be acknowledged and this is to be taught, and incur I, I just think that might be crossing the line just a little bit. Um, see, I see it more from a theological standpoint than a, a political standpoint of, as far as crossing the line. 
I mean, you know, it, it sounds like, okay, on the one hand, yeah, you know, it's makes sense to acknowledge that, you know, God's going to take care of us. But at the same time, it almost sounds like, uh, um, well, it, it, kind of that idea that if we mention God and we specifically ask him for this, then he'll give it to us. And But he's not going to take care of us if we don't, you know, ask him to. And um, so it's it's sort of, it's almost like a good luck charm, you know? It's like like saying you hang in your uh, rosary or your Saint Christopher medal on your um, on your uh, rearview mirror, you know. I don't know. It just right. well, yeah, you see, the thing is too is that it it it, it I don't know. I guess it's a, it's a it's a first article type thing that God gives us stuff. Um, you know, uh, God gives rain to the just and the unjust. God gives this, you know, without our prayers, without our asking. You know, God, you know. Um, on the other hand, you know, really that promise is directed to the to, to the believer that God, you know, gives you know gives His protection to those who trust in Him. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and there's not an idea really of the state having a trust in Him. Right. Right. Because what if you have you know sometimes you get two Christian states that are against each other, or <laughs> you know. The, Rival Christian forces. <laughs> like, oh, God's on our side, you know. Well, no, he's on our side. That was the Thirty Years' War. That's already been done. Yeah. Yeah, but it still goes on in uh, parts of the Middle oh, East yeah. at times. Oh, and uh, how about Christians? Northern Ireland. That's true. You know, Thirty Years' War was absolutely devastating, led to... Um, uh, cannibalism led to horrible things, and it was all over religion, which says it's not always – there are dangerous things when people can't say um, – you know, have any attitudes and understandings of saying, you know, we did, we're going to disagree on this point, and that's okay. And – which is, by the way, part of the reason why uh, Europe is such a secular society is because, of course, they um, – um, they saw the devastation that religious religion could bring. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the other hand, we can also talk about the good things that religion will bring, and that being prayer. And uh, so there was an article in the New York Times. Of about, all places. Um, of all places. Well, no, I can't say that. <laughs> the New York Times often has a lot of good stuff. Um, talking about... Uh, Online prayer things, uh, prayer sites, uh, things you can you can pray for, and, and groups that will pray for you. Um, it's interesting, um, but well, um, go ahead and then I'll talk about what okay. what's, what's, what struck me as most interesting. So you got uh, prayabout.com and ourprayer.org and, and basically both of these are, are kind of the same idea um you you post your prayer request and you um and then uh people all over the world um will see your prayer request and they'll pray for you and um and when they have <clears throat> when they have requests then they'll post their requests and you have a whole bunch of people praying for each other uh it's a very similar concept to something that I started up a while back mentioned on the show, um, on Twitter, uh, Twitter, uh, uh, praying voices. And, um, and if anybody's on Twitter, you can check that one out. And it's the same idea. You post your prayer requests and everybody pray for you. Um, which, you know, I look at the, one of them is people will actually post back and say, Hey, I'm praying for you or actually type out the prayer that they prayed. Um, which always seemed kind of odd to me. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but it just kind of, like, well, in, in, so that, you know, in case so God needs to read this post or something, but, um, I guess it lets people know how you're praying for him. But, um, you know, the other one is, is more, it doesn't, people just post their stuff. And if someone wants to respond to them privately, they can. Um, my big concern with, uh, I've got a couple. Uh, why don't you go ahead first and then I'll mention mine. Well, I found it interesting that the ones that they highlight the most is unity. Uh, the Unity School of Christianity in, um, they, they say outside Kansas City. It's actually Lee Summit, Missouri is where it's located. And, uh, that they deal with two million prayer requests a year. 
And the Unity School of Christianity is not Christian. It's a metaphysical movement. Um, that, uh, but but it got it used to get so much mail that it was the first uh, business to have its own zip code. Because that they just got uh, so many, so much mail going through there, and I don't know if anybody else ever saw back in the days before twenty. You wouldn't know the days before that television was on twenty four hours a day. There used to yeah, be this time when you know it went off about one in the morning. You know, back when you know the Stone Age, and um, just before it would go off, they would have almost every night some actor doing the word from Unity, and uh, you know, doing kind of almost a little devotion. And it was a it was a real popular thing. Um, See, so I was, was never up that late, but I used to get up late. early on on Saturday mornings, and when it was still just a test pattern, and then I'd I'd wait uh, for Underdog to come on. Yeah, that's a good thing. I used to do that too. Um, but anyhow, so the uh, uh, but the the other part about this is interesting is that that they you know it, it it's almost like the idea of prayer in and of itself is doing something. You know, I often tell my people, it's not the prayer, it's God. You know, it's who you're praying to. Mm-hmm. And, but this can, you know, the, 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 the thing, you know, they're offering prayers for, like, for and by pagans, Christians, Wiccans, you know, and everybody but the atheists who have their own God is imaginary dot org, you know, and going that direction. So it's almost like the idea of, you know, Jesus says, you know, don't believe you're being heard in your prayers because of your many words. And it's almost the idea of, you know, if you pile the words onto God, um, he's going to answer the prayer. Well, it's this sort of mob mentality. Well, if if enough people, you know, will will pray, then um, then God will listen. But if it's just one person, you know, he's not as likely to listen. Which I'm sorry, each person is of infinite value to God, and He listens to each of us, not because we deserve it, but because Jesus earned that right for us by His death on the cross. Right. That's why He listens I, to not us. To say... There's, it's not a good thing to have. I mean, oftentimes, I mean, you, you and I, you know, we, we pray for our people and we encourage others to pray for our mm-hmm. people. I remember I had mm-hmm. one woman going into mm-hmm. surgery and I said, you know, we, I would just want you to be wrapped in a cocoon of prayer as you go into, to, to, to this, you know, we're just going to be lifting you up in prayer, you know, um, and she found that so comforting. Yeah. And, you know, we sometimes we get requests from, you know, you know, I went to the jail on Friday, and one of the inmates came up to me and says, "You know, I pray for your son every day." Hmm. Yeah, I want you to know that. Hmm. I've, I've said, you know, put my son out there. I said, "You got more guys in jail praying for you, you know, probably than any other soldier over there." So, you know, I think God doesn't mess with these inmates, you know. It's, 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 <laughs> you know, so I'm not worried. Um, but uh, you know, so I think you know, those are. But this almost strikes me as the idea that if you know, if I set it out there, I get enough people. Then yeah, then God will. God's got to answer this the way I. God's got to answer this the way I want. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. that we can bully him. You know, I think it's 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 one thing to say, Lord, we're just going to let you. You know, this is just in your name. This is, but there's this other idea of you know, almost this is you know, if we, if we get enough people praying, because uh, one of them says you know it's uh, the site run by followers of uh, Norman Vincent Peale the. The power of positive thinking. You know, if you, mm-hmm. if you pray enough, we'll get this. Yeah, and I've even seen books with titles like How to Pray and Get What You Want and, you know, and all kinds of stuff like that. And, and yeah, it's, you know, we, we need to pray and say, Thy will be done, you know, and trust that God's going to take care of us. And trust that God is going to take care of us whether we ask or not. We don't pray in order to get what we want. We pray because God's our Father, because He loves right. us, because we love Him, and like talking to people who love you, you know? I mean, how cool is it that the God of the universe, you have His ear, you know, that He's promised He's going to listen to you? I mean, mm-hmm. I I had this, this cool idea how to solve the, the economy, so I sent out a note, or the... the um, the, this whole bailout thing. So I sent out a note to all my congressmen and to the, um, the, uh, uh, to Barack Obama's, uh, transition people and to, um, to the subcommittee of the House that's, that's handling this issue and stuff. And you know what? I'll bet you none of them actually read it. Okay. 
but I felt like I got to do something. Okay. But God, God listens. He listens to everything I say when I don't even have to say it. He knows it in my heart. He knows even the stuff that I can't put into words. He knows exactly mm -hmm. what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. And he really, truly cares. All right. So I, I think these sites are great to encourage people to pray. I, I find personally, I don't feel like I pray enough, um, that I, very often take God for granted and I get so wrapped up in, in the busyness of life that I'm, I don't set aside that time, just me and God time. And, um, and I feel like I need to do that stuff like this helps because especially if you can set it up with where you get, you know, something in your email or something like that, someplace where it's going to keep popping up and reminding you, I think that's great. And I think that, that we, as a church can really benefit if you've got people praying for each other all the time. It just, you know, it, it just strengthens that bond. And, uh, and so I think it's, it's just a, it's a wonderful thing. And just, just to let people know, and boy, you know, anytime somebody says, Hey, I'm praying for you, you just, you feel loved, you know, this person cares enough about me that they set aside time out of their time to take me to God, you know, to take my concerns to God. And wow, how cool so, is that? If I get two million people praying, will I get my CDs back from Malaysia? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Malaysia. Malaysia has got to be the most oppressive anti-Christian government on earth, with the exception of like Iran and Syria. Well, I think it's getting right up there with them. Um. Uh, and, so anyway, and, there's a. Yeah. There's a Malaysian Christian woman, and um, she brought in some Christian educational CDs that she bought in Indonesia, and they confiscated all eight of them uh, uh, because the title said the word Allah, which is prohibit prohibited in non-Muslim religious material. Now, considering the fact that the word Allah means God... It's just the generic word, the same way that we say God... In like when right. we say, yes, yes, yes. Um, "Oh, thank God, this everything worked out," or or even using it as right. a, a sort of when you say, like, "Oh my God," or you know, or you know, sort of using it in vain, we'd say, um, "It's just the generic word for God." Right. It's it's just it's the generic, er, er, and if you go into Arabic Christian churches, and they say, you know, in the name of Allah the Father, Allah the Son, Allah the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's not a, it's not really a proper, except in Malaysia. And they consider this, you know, a la, little, you know, trademark, you know, behind it. Mm -hmm. um, Which is really ironic because the, um, the whole reason that Muslims don't use a specific, um, unique name for God is, and they just say Allah is because they say, well, there is no other God. So, um, yeah, so we just, that's good enough, you know? Right. So it's, you know, so now all of a sudden they're saying, no, that's his name. No, that's not his name. That's the point. <laughs> I understand that. And I'm not Muslim. No. Uh, and you say, well, see, they're expressed that if the Christian uses the word Allah, yeah, you know, that might confuse the Muslim and draw them to Christianity. Okay. And, and you know, my response to that is, if Islam is such a, a great thing, then you don't need to be afraid that people are going to find out about other religions. You know? I encourage my people to find out about... Yeah, good, you want to know what this other church teaches? Find out what they teach. I'm not afraid that you're all of a sudden going to go, oh, this is so much better. Because I think we've got, I mean, we've got the corner on on awesomeness, you know? We have the pure coffee. <laughs> we don't water our coffee down like those other people do. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, so, you know, don't go to Malaysia and, and ask for... Um, 
for coffee when you know when or try to bring some coffee in there that's not real coffee, not their kind of coffee, because <laughs> especially CDs that sing about other kinds of coffee. Yeah. yeah, the interesting thing, too, is that their constitution guarantees freedom of worship for the non-Muslims, who are one-third of the country's 27 million. This is, however, Buddhists, Christians, and Hindus have said, you know, there's a lot of religious discrimination going on, uh, uh, such as the occasional de- de- demolition of a Hindu temple by state authorities. Uh, Oops! <laughs> yeah. But, you know, they re- they said that no non-Muslim yeah, not Muslims cannot use the word Allah at all. Fear of a name only increases fear of the thing itself. That makes it really hard to talk about. What you know? What do you believe? Like, because if okay, if I was going to talk to a Muslim and, and find out about what they believe, so what do you believe about Allah? <laughs> like, <laughs> you're under arrest, you know. <laughs> but I was just asking. <laughs> Oh, it's, you know, this is the whole, this is just like, all right, countries. All right, you want to know where's a good country to live? All right, ask this. Are people trying to get in or are people trying to get out? You know, yeah, Cuba, people are trying to escape. Nobody's, you know, Cuba doesn't have a big immigration problem like we do in the United States. All right, say what you want about the United States, but people are desperate to get in here. And nobody's desperate to get out. And if they want to, okay, bye. <laughs> you know, see ya. You know, come back. Let us know. So, yeah. Well, this, this just kind of goes back to, you know, and again, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, uh, uh, with Kentucky that the whole issue of establishment, this is why we don't establish religion. Mm-hmm. That's right here, you know, to keep stuff like this from happening. You know, um, we do have this very blessed First Amendment, which which allows you know which allows a religious pluralism, which kind of gets a little difficult to deal with sometimes. But you know, it, it kind of reminds me. I read stuff like this. It kind of reminds me. You know, the guy who said, you know, democracy is the worst form of governance. Until of course you tried some of the other forms of governance. You know, I mean, yeah, First Amendment can be one of those troublesome things to deal with. Until of course you, you see something like this. And you're like, Thank God I live in America. Yeah. Yep. Duh. But we have listeners yeah, and viewers all over the world. And so, you know, talking about uh, hearing back from our from our listeners and viewers. What do you think about this? You know? And 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 how do you how do you, you know, do you feel secure in your freedom and your rights in in your country? I know we have um we have listeners in China uh occasionally. And I uh, have a hunch we're not going to hear from them. <laughs> Speaking of countries you want to um, get out of that. Although China, you'd think they'd be anxious to let people go because they've got such an overpopulation problem. But that's another issue entirely. <laughs> so, But yeah, we are interested in your comments, your thoughts, and everything else. Because uh, as much as we enjoy doing this show, we really want it to be your show. Yep. <sighs> so, so, once again, it's... Um, podcast at crossfeednews.com. Also, please make it your show. Um, you know, use our, our, um, uh, our, uh, our site, post your own stories, comment on the stories that are there. It's a very easy Drupal site, works very well. Nothing difficult about it at all. Uh, yep. Matter of fact, our congregation is looking at moving over to Drupal for its, uh, 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 for its writing, and I said, oh, that's what we use, and so I said, if you need help using Drupal, you have a Drupal expert sitting right over there, and it's the guy in the little box there. Not me, the guy in the little box. <laughs> well, I'm not an expert either. I just have friends that are that help me out a lot, and, and in fact, I'll plug them, geeksandgod.com. Um, they've got a great podcast, too. Helps out churches um, with not just Drupal, although they talk about that a lot, but... Uh, um, just technology and churches and ministries. So really great guys. Cool. So God be with you all. Give you a good week. And uh, we will hopefully we'll see you later on this week. Yep. Dale, take care. Have a good week. Yeah, you too. Good night, everybody. God bless.